Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I'm here to help you finish your Christmas shopping list and let everyone else over there stiff arm their competition while trying to fight off that trip to fan on Turkey Night. Now, what we did was we partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States, where you can get up to 75% off over 30,000 autographed sports collectibles during this holiday season. They have something for everyone. But how is RSA able to offer such great deals on JSA authentication, you ask? Well, they do this by making deals directly with athletes so there are no extra markups, and they choose to then pass that savings on to you, the customer. Now, all orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and a money-back guarantee. But hurry up because customers are so stark raving mad for RSA that memorabilia sells out daily. All you have to do is head over to shoprsa.com forward slash SHN. Again, that's shoprsa.com forward slash SHN. So don't wait to bring home your favorites and own a piece of sports history for you and the loved ones on your shopping list this holiday season. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. The Rose Bowl. The game that inspired the college football bowl season has a long and storied history. The stadium itself is 100 years old, and in celebration of it, Pigskin Dispatch is assembling some of the top historians and authors to share the memories, people, and events that make the granddaddy of them all the special game that it is. Enjoy this Rose Bowl memory from pigskindispatch.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal of the positive football history. And as we have been doing here uh, for the last few days, we're going to go on and continue all the way to the big game at the New Year's Day weekend. Uh, we're talking Rose Bowl and Rose Bowl history. We have a lot of great people coming on and talking. And today is no exception, but we have one of our friends that was on an episode a little over a year ago, uh, Scott Ferguson Green. Uh, Scott, welcome back to the Pig Pen. Thank you, Darren. Thank you very much for having me back. Now, Scott, just to remind the listeners, I don't have to remind you what you spoke about, but we talked about the Union Club of Phoenixville uh, early pro football team, uh, your hometown uh, in the Philadelphia area. That was a, a great uh, tribute back to, to that club and some great players that they had. And, uh, you know, I, I know you, you're always got your, your nose to the ground and ear to the ground of, you know, listening and uh, trying to research and helping out wherever you can to preserve football history. Uh, do you have any uh, projects going on currently? Well, currently I'm the associate producer on the movie Triangle Park, and that is about the very first pro football game ever played in Dayton, Ohio, between the Dayton Triangles and the Columbus Panhandles. And um, I have a family connection in Dayton because my great-great-aunt and her husband moved there from Virginia to Dayton and had 16 children. So I went to see where they grew up. But while I was there, I actually visited Triangle Park, the site of the very first NFL football game ever played on October 3rd, 1920. And it was really uh, amazing to be there that that was the very site of the very first NFL game, then known as the American Professional Football Association. Yeah, wow, that is just a tremendous uh, history. So we're going back, what, 102 years, or over 102 years ago, uh, going back to this historic site and they're making a documentary of it. That's that's fantastic. It's a great way to yeah. preserve football history. They started shooting the movie already. Um, they shot in Dayton. They went and uh, went on location in Canton, Ohio, where they shot at uh, Bender's uh, in Canton, Ohio, where the original – uh, funding NFL owners met uh, to form the league and, and get everything set up for uh, the league. And um, uh, it, it, the movie already 
looks very good from the publicity shots that I've seen and the behind the scenes shots that I've seen. They are very accurate with the costuming and, and the time period because this did take place in that very first season of the American Professional Football Association uh, in the Roaring Twenties. And the fact that they were able to actually get this off the ground and the, the first game was played in Dayton, Ohio, of all places. Um, but Ohio was a football state. And so um, the interesting thing about the story is the fact that the there was the Columbus Panhandles tried to bring in some ringers from Ohio State to play in that football game, which caused a little bit of an uproar within um, the owners themselves. So it's going to be a very good docudrama. Um, it's supposed to be released next year. I'm looking forward to it being released. Uh, it is a movie that um, really has um, significance, and I think that a lot of people will, will take to seeing the film and enjoying the, the docudrama, and I'm hoping that it will be just another historical record of the founding of the National Football League. Wow, well, that sounds pretty fantastic. And I know uh, talking earlier, we have a lot of our, our friends that are historians uh, from PFRA that are involved in the production of this as well. So should be very historically accurate and a, a great piece of uh, Americana, I'm sure. And recently, um, the director, Alan Farce, who also wrote uh, the docudrama, um, he recently had a, someone who is his friend uh, who is part of the project, He, his friend uh, Chuck uh, Level is um, someone who's going to write the theme song for uh, the film. And uh, Chuck used to be part of the Amon Brothers band and also was the musical director and the keyboardist for the Rolling Stones. So, wow. um, That's some musical a, royalty there. Exactly. He has a big name. Alan got a big name as part of this project. So um, this there, this project is very much where it's got some really good, talented people in it. And um, I, I'm loving every bit of it that so many artistic, wonderful people are part of this project. Well, fantastic. Now, are, is there any tentative plans of when a release date or, or, or that you're shooting for to have this out? And, and, and what uh, kind of avenue is it going to be at the theaters or is it going to be on uh, television or how, how will this be released? We're not sure exactly when it's going to be released. I know that um, putting together the docudrama, the, the drama part has been shot. It was over several days. Um, and still putting everything together will probably take some time. I know because I am part of the, the film business, um, I know that if once a film may wrap, it could take up to a year or more, depending on um, what you need in post-production. So um, no announcement has been made about exactly when it's going to be released, but it is supposed to be released in 2023. Well, fantastic. Well, when when you guys get some solid things down, you know, you, yourself or anybody from your team wants to come on and, and talk about it, we're glad to have you on and uh, talk here in the pig pen about it. That would be great. But, you know, you mentioned that uh, that game, uh, the Dayton Triangles and Columbus Panhandles, that the, they were trying to bring some of the Ohio State players in as ringers. And that Ohio State team that year, 1920, ended up making it to the Rose Bowl. So, there's a little bit of a connection there. Uh, we won't go in too much on, on what happened at that Rose Bowl because we have a, a later episode coming up in a, a few days on that from, from this episode. But you are here to talk about a Rose Bowl game that is special to you, and uh, I'll let you introduce uh, uh, what you'd like to speak about today. Yes. The Rose Bowl, January 1st, 1917. It was between the Pennsylvania Quakers and the Oregon Webfoots. And this was the third Rose Bowl that was being played uh, since the founding of the game. At the time, the Rose Bowl was not known as the Rose Bowl. It was known as the Tournament East-West Football Game. And that game, as I previously mentioned, was played on Monday, January 1st, 1917. And 
it was put together by the Tournament of Roses Committee. And what they did was having a game was part of the celebration of the Tournament of Roses. And what the committee had to do was bring in temporary grandstands because there was such an anticipation for this football game that uh, they needed enough seating for 25,000 people. Now, there's various reports back then that 25,000 fans were in the stands or 26 or 27,000 were in the stands. But whatever the number, it was definitely over 25,000 because the grandstands were filled. So the location sta- almost is- a standing room only then type of Correct. event. Correct. Uh, okay. Correct. Now, the location was at Tournament Park in Pasadena, and that's about three miles from the actual Rose Bowl where the Rose Bowl stands today. Um, however, um, the uh, Pasadena Tournament of Roses Committee, like I said, put up those grandstands because it was something to be added to the celebration of the Tournament of Roses. As I mentioned, the uh, game was played between the Pennsylvania Quakers and the Oregon Webfoots. Now, Webfoots was the precursor of the name Duck, which is uh, the nickname of the Oregon team today, the Oregon Ducks. So um, it was interesting how they were called the Webfoots and then it evolved into the name Ducks. But the Pennsylvania Quakers in the 1960s season leading up to that tournament East-West game, now known as the Rose Bowl, they had a 7-2-1 and record uh, during the 1916 season. And they were considered a powerhouse in the East. They won mythical national championships for college football in 1894, 1895, 1897, 1904, 1907, 1908, and later on 1924. So the Pennsylvania Quakers were considered a mighty powerhouse in the East. Some of the notable players that came out of the Pennsylvania Quakers' history is, of course, Chuck Benark, who uh, went on to play two-way um, positions on the Philadelphia Eagles in the 1960 Philadelphia Eagles NFL Championship. John Heisman was also um, a member of the Pennsylvania Quakers team during its history. Heisman Trophy is named after him. And, of course, Burt Bell, the future co-founder of the Philadelphia Eagles and future NFL commissioner had played actually on this 1916 Pennsylvania Quakers football team. He was the starting quarterback. Now, the 1916 Pennsylvania Quakers football team was coached by Bob Folwell. Bob Folwell was known for being the very first coach of the 1925 New York Giants when they first entered into the NFL. And he was also the head coach of the 1926 Philadelphia Quakers of the NFL's rival AFL, the American Football League, the first one in 1926. And they won the championship um, that year in 1926. But in 1916, he was the head coach of the Pennsylvania Quakers and led the Quakers to their first and only bowl game. Um, some of the key players that played in, on that 1916 Pennsylvania Quakers team was Lud Ray, who was also the co-founder with Burt Bell of the Philadelphia Eagles. John uh, Henry John Heine Miller, who started his professional career playing for the independent pro football Phoenixville, Pennsylvania Big Red team that we spoke about earlier. That's my hometown. And he also went to play for uh, the Buffalo All-Americans, the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets, and the Milwaukee Badgers of the NFL. And, of course, as I mentioned previously, Burt Bell was on that 1916 Pennsylvania Quaker team. He was actually the starting quarterback for that first game of the season for the Pennsylvania Quakers in 1916. But because of mixed results, he was platooned in um, as a quarterback for the rest of the season. So. He was rotated in and out. He was a little bit different from the other players, his other teammates on the team, because he would drive up to practices 
or to the game in a Cadillac where there, a lot of his teammates had to find other modes of transportation to get around. But Bert Bell was the defensive back, uh, the punter, punt returner of the Quakers. And um, so we had some notable people that were on the Pennsylvania Quakers. As far as the Oregon Webfoots were concerned, um, they had a um, very good record, seven wins, zero losses, and one tie during the 1960 season. Some of the notable players that were on that team was Shy Huntington and his brother Hollis Huntington. Shy was the Huntington uh, starting quarterback for the Webfoots, and his brother Hollis Huntington was the fullback. Uh, another star who was on the Webfoot team was John Beckett, and John Beckett was a uh, All Pacific Coast Conference um, team uh, in 1916. The Oregon Webfoots, as I mentioned, had a 7-0-1 record um, for the 1916 season. Uh, their very first game of the season, they won 97 to nothing over uh, Willamette, uh, a smaller college. Their one tie was against the Washington Huskies as they played to a 0-0 tie. Oregon outscored their opponents that year in, in 1916, 176 to 17. So they were pretty strong when they would uh, play in competition. They were 2-0-1 uh, in the conference, the Pacific Coast Conference. Uh, there were only four teams in the Pacific Coast Conference as college football was starting to develop conferences. This was Oregon's first season in the Pacific Coast Conference. It was Washington Huskies' first season in the Pacific Coast Conference. But um, the four teams that were in the Pacific Coast Conference were the Oregon Webfoots, the Washington Huskies, the Oregon Agriculture College, now known as Oregon State, and California. And the Washington Huskies actually were the champions of the Pacific Coast Conference because they had one more win uh, more than the Oregon Webfoots. But on November 20th, 1916, the Oregon um, Webfoots were selected as by the Tournament of Roses committee to be the West representative to play in the tournament East-West football game, now known as the Rose Bowl, of course. And so the, the question comes up, okay, if Oregon did not win the conference championship, why were they selected instead of the Washington Huskies? Well, the reason was it actually is a shorter distance by train to transport players to the Rose Bowl from Oregon than it would be from Washington. That was the only reason why the Oregon Westwoods were selected to play in that Rose Bowl game because it was a shorter distance by train. <laughs> and, and they're sending a team from the from Philadelphia to play there, which is thousands of miles. <laughs> exactly. But they needed, a, of course, a team to pick um, from the east. And they picked Pennsylvania because of the fact they were considered such a powerhouse. Now, W.S. Glenholt, he was the chairman of the Tournament of Roses Committee, he received a telegram from the University of Pennsylvania which stated that the football team, Pennsylvania, would play no other game uh, in the West except for the Rose Bowl game when they played Oregon Webfoot. And that was important because there were – always worries the fact that it would actually spread the the um, the crowd thinner if you have someone like Pennsylvania or some other big East um, powerful football team playing on the West Coast because at that time when they thought that that was where the most of the power was, was in the East, they were afraid that people would just go to wherever the team uh, would play so that they would able to see that. And so there, they were afraid that there wouldn't be that much of a buildup for the, the Rose Bowl. But the Rose Bowl committee picked Pennsylvania, as I said, because of the fact that they were such a powerhouse in the East. 
Now, the only thing that um, might have been a little bit of a challenge is, so you have the Oregon web foot being selected for the Rose Bowl. You have the Pennsylvania Quakers being selected for the Rose Bowl. Everything's all set, right? Huh, not so fast. At um, Oregon, in order for the football team to play, they had to receive approval from the faculty. The faculty at Oregon had to actually approve the football team to play in the Rose Bowl because the fact that the Rose Bowl was being played around the Christmas and New Year's holiday, Oregon had to actually receive permission to send their football team to the Rose Bowl. Fortunately, there was no objection, so Oregon uh, actually got that permission. As I mentioned, the Pennsylvania Quakers were favored to win um, this third edition of the Rose Bowl. Uh, so many Eastern colleges were considered powerhouses. Uh, Pennsylvania Quakers actually beat Pennsylvania State Nittany Lions during that 1916 season. Uh, they actually beat uh, Cornell, a uh, big red football team, which con was considered a powerhouse. One of the top teams of the 1916 season was Army. They were 9-0 and undefeated. Also, the University of Pittsburgh, the Panthers were 8 and oh, they were considered quite the powerhouse. And that was one of the two teams that the Pennsylvania Quakers lost to in the 1916 season because they actually played, um, the powerhouse teams played against each other. Um, also, teams like the Brown Bears, Colgate, Yale, they all had eight wins and one loss. So college football being started in the East, there was always that perception that Eastern teams were better than all the other teams in the country. The actual Rose Bowl game itself, um, Pennsylvania started dominating Oregon. Twice they drove uh, inside the Oregon 20-yard line in their territory and attempted two field goals after two straight dominating drives. But each time, Pennsylvania missed the field goal. The passing game was something that was an excitement to the fans because previously in, in the Rose Bowl of 1916, January 1st, 1916, that was played between the Washington State Cougars and the Brown Bears. Brown Bears having Fritz Pollard on that team, the famous Fritz Pollard Hall of Famer. However, there were only five total passes attempted in that 1916 Rose Bowl game. The rest of it was running. It, that old saying, um, three yards in a cloud of dust, that certainly was true in the 1916 Rose Bowl game. But this one where there was more passing, and so that really did excite the fans. The Pennsylvania Quakers, um, after a 0-0 halftime score, they came out in the third quarter again and dominated Oregon defense and got deep again inside the red zone, but they fumbled the ball. That was the turning point in the game. The Oregon Webfoots recovered the fumble and marched down the field. Oregon started attacking the center of the Pennsylvania Quakers defensive line and started to wear Pennsylvania down. Oregon also occasionally passed the football but they didn't pass that much. But when they did, they actually would connect on short, sharp passes that proved effective. Oregon got down to the Pennsylvania 20-yard line, tried a field goal, but they missed. So it's still 0-0 in the third quarter. Pennsylvania turned the ball over again as Oregon Shy Huntington picked off Burt Bell three times. Pennsylvania ended, throw, ended up throwing five interceptions in that game. In the third quarter, Oregon once again marched down the field. The quarterback for Oregon, Shai Huntington, completed a 15-yard TD pass to Lloyd Tater. He was the left end. Then came the fourth quarter. Um, the Pennsylvania Quakers turned the ball over 
once again on an interception thrown by Burt Bell. And Pennsylvania Quakers' Bob Fullwell pulled Burt Bell from the game after that interception. Oregon uh, taking the ball over. They once again marched down the field and scored on a one-yard run by the right halfback, Johnny Parsons. And left end John Beckett, who received almost, uh, received most of the passes that were thrown by Oregon, and there weren't that many, there were only nine, he ended up being the MVP of the 1917 Rose Bowl. Even though Oregon only got 32 net yards in passing. So it's interesting how they were able to dominate the Pennsylvania Quakers, and it was the key passes that actually helped prove to be effective so that they, could, when they did rush the football, they found a weakness in the center of the Pennsylvania defense line. The Pennsylvania Quakers actually outscored the Oregon Webfoots, or not outscored, um, outplayed them as far as statistics go. The, um, they had 13 first downs to Oregon's eight. The net rushing yards, Pennsylvania had 111. Um, net passing, Pennsylvania had 131 to Oregon's 32. Total yards, Pennsylvania Quakers had 242 yards, and the Oregon Webfoots had 230 yards. But it was back and forth because there were um, many, many punts, 26 punts in all during that 1917 Rose Bowl game. This game, when it ended, it ended with the Oregon Webfoots winning 14 to nothing. That was a huge deal in the West because of the fact that the perception always was that the Eastern powerhouse football teams could n never really lose against any Western team or Midwest team. This was such a huge deal. The fact is, is that in the 1916 Rose Bowl game between Washington State and Brown Bears, Brown was not considered a powerhouse of the East, even though they had Fritz Pollard on the team. Why? Because of what we now know as the strength of schedule. No one thought that the Brown Bears had a really tough schedule. So the previous year um, at the Rose Bowl between Washington State Cougars and the Brown Bears, that was not considered that big of a deal. But this Rose Bowl game in 1917, when Oregon beat Pennsylvania, that was considered a big deal. The papers all over the West, um, for example, the Eugene Daily Guard, the day after the Rose Bowl, the Oregon Webfoot's win over Pennsylvania made the front page. That's how big that was. And in, for example, the uh, Spokesman Daily Review from Spokane, Washington, that made the front page of the sports page. The um, Desiree News from Salt Lake City, Oregon's win over Pennsylvania made the front of the sports page. Going back to the Eugene Daily Guard, the subheading was fast, snappy football keeps enormous crowd of spectators at Pasadena on edge. It was the game that was back and forth that made it exciting for the fans. Even the Los Angeles Times had a story on Oregon's win over Pennsylvania. And as far south as Los Angeles is from Eugene, the fact that a team from the west beat the team from the east and a powerhouse like the Pennsylvania Quakers was a big deal. There was a columnist that was uh, um, wrote for the Los Angeles Times, and his name was Harry Williams, and he actually did what we would consider now a commentary. And part of his commentary about the 1917 Rose Bowl game, he stated, although barred from the 
football blue book, we will endeavor in our modest way, despite this handicap, to lick the stuffing out of every Eastern team, unquote. That was on the page. That was actually documented in the Los Angeles Times. And so um, the the fact that you had a team from the West be the powerhouse from the East was really the turning point on the perception of college football fans about the balance of power. It wasn't perceived any more that all the power was in the East because you had the Oregon Webfoot beat the Pennsylvania Quakers. This wow. was the Rose Bowl that altered the thinking about college football as a whole between Eastern teams and Western teams. And that's why this Rose Bowl of 1917, January 1st, 1917, is so significant in the history of college football. Wow. I mean, first of all, Scott, tremendous uh, work on the research and the detail uh, telling that whole story. That's I mean, that's, that's great. Uh, a couple of observations, I guess, uh, you know, losing the turnover battle doesn't matter what era of football you're in. If you have five turnovers, you're probably not going to win that ball game. And I think uh, the Penn Quakers demonstrated that uh, 105 years ago. And, uh, you know, and I thought it was interesting that the MVP, you said, was John Beckett, an offensive lineman, and, uh, you know, caught some passes. Now, back in that era, there was not the, the eligible receivers were not the same rules that we have today, where you can only have terminal ends on the line and backs catching. I think they had, were allowed a little bit more. Almost anybody could catch a pass back then until the rules were modified a little bit more, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, very, very good job on that. So thank you for sharing that with us. You're welcome. I, I personally, um, because I'm from Pennsylvania, um, because I was born in the town outside of Philadelphia, of course, the University of Pennsylvania is located in Philadelphia. And so when I first came upon this um, game of the 1917 Rose Bowl game and the fact that Pennsylvania was in it, when I didn't know the results previously when I was very young. When I was reading about this, I was hoping that I would read that Pennsylvania won. However, <laughs> they did not. And like you said, you have five turnovers. It's going to be very, very difficult to win those games. And even though that Burt Bell was, um, he was the starting quarterback. And like I said, he, he was platooned at times where he was in and out. Um, he was a leader, uh, on that Pennsylvania Quakers football team. And he went on to serve in World War I. But the fact is, is that even someone like Bird Bell, if you throw five interceptions, it's very difficult to win a football game. Absolutely. And we've uh, had the opportunity a couple of times to get to talk to Upton Bell, his son, uh, quite a bit about Bert Bell. And uh, Bert Bell's father, you said how he drove a Cadillac <laughs> Uh, to school, but his, their family, uh, Burt Bell's father was John C. Bell, who owned some hotels around the Philadelphia area, some big hotels, the luxury hotels. And, uh, you know, he was also on that early football rules committees, uh, with uh, Walter Camp and I believe played stocking cap era football, uh, back with the Yales and the Harvards uh, and Penns back in those, uh, you know, late 19th century game. So the right. family is like the, the royal family of American football history, that's for sure. Yes. Pennsylvania Quakers were so popular that they led the uh, highest attendance in college football for decades. And, for example, uh, the owner of the 1926 AFL champion Philadelphia Quakers, he got that name Quakers. He wanted that nickname for his professional football team in Red Grange's American Football League because of the Pennsylvania Quakers and because some of the Pennsylvania Quakers actually uh, played on that Philadelphia Quakers football team later on in the 1920s um, because of the fact that um, they came from the local area where they were able to pick up talent. So that's how popular the Pennsylvania Quakers were, they did feel that they let down uh, Eastern football when they lost to the Oregon Webfoot. 
like I said, they had dominated that Rose Bowl game on the ground and in the air, but the turnovers was what did the Quakers in. Mm. Well, fantastic job, and Scott, we really appreciate you, you coming on here and sharing this in this Rose Bowl celebration and talking about such a, a monumental and important game in Rose Bowl history and in football history, uh, you know, sort of balancing out the, the disparity uh, that was thought of between the Eastern and Western football, and it definitely did. It was an equalizer when you have a, a big win like that that Oregon had. So thanks for joining us here today, and uh, appreciate it, and we hope to talk to you again real soon. Thank you, Darren. I really appreciate you having me on and talking about my favorite college bowl game is the Rose Bowl. Absolutely love it. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network. And we're able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history. But as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment. You know that. Can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website, seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.